Great. Um, thanks very much. Um, we're delighted to um, be here in the session with you um, today. Um, and what we'd like to um, talk to you about um, in this first part of the session is service redesign by engagement. So some tools um, that we've developed at the Centre for Rural Health um, in relation to that rural health context. Um, so you've just heard, um, I'm Sarah Aminoz and I'm here with um, my colleague Amy um, from the Centre for Rural Health. Um, and our centre is a research institute which is um, a collaboration between University of the Highlands and Islands and University of Aberdeen. Um, and we're based in Inverness in the north of Scotland. So the aim of what we're doing um, in this first presentation is to present to you some tools and processes that we have developed for involving um, both rural communities and also rural healthcare professionals um, in service redesign. And the structure um, is to run through talking about some of these methods for engaging communities, um, also for engaging the workforce, and to try and draw out some key lessons from our work, um, and then some time for questions and discussion at the end. Um, so we're, we're going to be trying to um, get through two, uh, sorry, four tools um, and processes for you today. Obviously, um, we have limited time, um, so we're just going to give a brief overview of each of these, um, but really happy to talk to anyone about these in more detail um, afterward the session. So just a bit of background about um, the centre. We've got um, some key uh, research priorities um, that um, kind of underpin the work that we'll be talking about today. Firstly, the health of rural people. So thinking about things like health, health outcomes and health inequalities, um, but also the provision of and access to health services in rural areas around issues of accessibility and sustainability of service, for example. Um, we're really concerned with the lived experience of rural health, so what is it like for rural people um, in terms of quality of life or perceptions of well-being. Um, the methods that we use are very focused on engaging stakeholders. We often use participatory methods and action research, for example. But we're also interested in measuring and modelling change, um, and we have some expertise in health economics um, and use of spatial methodologies, for example, as well. So a bit, uh, just a bit about the Scottish context in which um, most of our um, work has been uh, carried out. Um, the policy context is quite similar to many of the European countries we've been uh, hearing about at the conference um, so far, with trends towards self-management, self-care, for example, um, also discussions around um, community engagement in the design um, and the delivery of health services, um, discussions around uh, local decision-making processes, um, but also what's been called um, entrepreneurialism um, in terms of a greater involvement of non-state organisations in the provision of our health services. And just a bit about the um, rural health service delivery context that we're talking about. We have increasingly ageing populations. Um, our rural health service professionals have often been um, in their current positions for a number of years, um, bringing lots of added value to their communities. Um, and time and again, we hear about people going above and beyond their job descriptions. Um, but there are some staff retention and recruitment difficulties, particularly around encouraging young health professionals um, to take up a, a rural um, career pathway. Um, engagement is now often a statutory requirement. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate into um, engagement being carried out um, on the ground or it being easy to carry out on the ground. There are still barriers um, to that um, process being carried out. Um, and of course, we are all dealing with decreasing um, budgets. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, just to uh, give you here, um, um, this is a, a map of Scotland um, and it's using the eightfold um, government classification of urban and rural areas. So you can see that there are different types of rural um, within Scotland, and that's from the accessible rural through to the very remote rural. Um, all of these areas have um, settlements with less than 3,000 uh, population, um, but the very remote rural is uh, more than a 60-minute drive from an urban centre. Um, you can see that very remote category is the light um, yellow colour on the map. Um, and a lot of the, the west and north of the country falls into that category, and that's um, the Highlands and Islands where um, we're based and our, our work's been carried out. 
So within that area, there are often um, small and dispersed settlements. There can be um, difficult um, weather conditions to cope with, limited transport accessibility, and we've mentioned increasingly ageing populations within these um, settlements. So Amy's going to tell us a bit about um, engagement with communities. Sure. Hi. Okay, so um, as Sarah Ann said, one of our sort of key strands to our research is looking at engaging stakeholders in different types of decision making, um, especially around um, planning for future services. Um, so just, just to get a sort of idea, can I get a show of hands in the room for how many people have actually done some kind of stakeholder engagement before? Okay, a fair few of you, that's good. So you'll probably uh, all know already that engagement isn't exactly all sort of sunshine and rainbows all the time. Um, it can be really difficult, it can be challenging, it can be costly, it can be time consuming, um, and it can, it can actually be quite uncomfortable sometimes as well if, if it's in a, a confrontational type of situation. So we thought we'd start by talking about some of the benefits um, for doing engagement well. And I'm emphasizing doing engagement well because, as uh, Sarah Ann said, um, our current policy context um, really emphasizes engagement, but actually in Scotland it's a statutory requirement for all of our service providers. So they do actually have to engage with service users around service redesign. Um, so in terms of um, engagement, if it's done well, there's the potential there to lead to empowered communities. So not just communities of place, but also communities of staff, communities of patients. Um, and also there's potential for resilience with sort of learning new skills. There's the potential to have um, more involved, responsible citizens. Um, there's the potential to increase knowledge and social capital within communities. Um, Crucially, I think, um, around uh, service design, um, I think engagement valorizes this frontline experience. So it can lead to a clearer understanding of service issues as they're experienced at the point of delivery. But it, there's also the potential, and this is important in, in the current economic climate, to improve allocative efficiency. So there's the potential for services to be going where they are actually really needed. So what I'm just going to do now is tell you about um, a couple of tools that um, we've actually developed within the Centre for Rural Health that um, can help to engage with um, rural communities. And by that, I generally mean um, geographical communities. And then I'm going to pass on to Sarah Ann, who's going to tell you a little bit about um, methods that we've used to engage with different stakeholder groups. So the first one that I'm going to tell you about is something called the CCAT, um, the Community Capitals Assessment Tool. And this was uh, developed within the centre by a researcher called Maria Pryor. Um, and Maria was interested in what Sarah Ann just mentioned, really, the fact that rural practitioners bring added value to communities. So that's not necessarily just in terms of additional uh, clinical services. That can also be in terms of um, other value that they bring to the community. And I'll speak about that in a second. Now this value, this added value, um, can be really important to rural communities, but it's often not captured within current NHS Scotland reporting or planning structures, and that can lead to a lot of conflict between communities and the NHS when it comes to planning. And understanding the value um, can actually help to, um, to help to understand the impact that a service change could have on a community, um, and especially the impact that it can have on community sustainability. <laughs> So the aim is really, um, the aim of this tool is really to use the community capitals framework to capture this al added value contribution. Um, and we use a single tool to capture this um, contribution by all the institutions in a community. Um, and to do so by generating data on self-reported behaviors and perceptions of residents in that community. So it's actually, try not to spill the water here, um, it's actually in the form of a questionnaire um, and we've got a few copies with it if anybody's interested. Um, we can certainly, it's in the public domain so um, it's recently been um, sort of iteratively uh, refined so um, if anyone wants to get a copy of that please come up to us afterwards. Um, but basically what it's looking at is um, we've got a, a, a diagram from Maria here and this is just in terms, I, can anyone actually read that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is just in terms of the added value from health services, and if you can, if you can read that at the bottom, 
Um, just in terms of the individual health professionals, research that Maria did in um, both rural Scotland and rural Australia showed that they bring um, not only their professional qualifications but also human, social and economic capital to these communities. So it gives you a sense of um, the sort of impact that changing a service like that might have. So that's the CCAT. Um, I'll just put that there. So the next tool, um, so the CCAT really is looking at um, what kind of impact would a service change have on a community and it's engaging them by finding out what they value um, and finding out what kind of impact they would feel would be made um, from a service change. But the next tool that I'm going to talk about, um, the Remote Service Futures game, is actually more about anticipatory um, primary care service planning and that's partnership planning. So this would be a tool um, that you would really only use if you were in a position to give some of that planning power over to your remote community. So it was developed um, basically because we felt through um, reviewing methods, reviewing the literature, and by speaking to people sort of through anecdotal evidence, that there was maybe a gap in, um, in the methods that were available for um, this kind of context for planning. So what did we, well, what did we want from a method? We really wanted something that would be simple to carry out, so a manager would be able to use it if they didn't have experience in using quite complex methodologies. We wanted something that would result in a straightforward type of data that could be directly implemented, so there wouldn't be any really complex data analysis, but also the format that it would finish in would be something that could be used directly for planning. We wanted something that um, incorporated difficult financial trade-offs, um, and was in, as informed as possible about all of the potential options available for remote and rural healthcare delivery. The most, this is a big chunk of text and I'm sorry, um, but this basically is one of the most important things. We wanted something that would combine the information that managers use to make decisions, so mainly quantitative um, aggregate data, things around needs profiles, um, budgetary information and things like employment regulations and safety regulations. We wanted to be able to combine that meaningfully with community data. And from the literature we found that um, quite often um, community contributions are experiential or um, in a sort of narrative format and it can be really difficult for managers with the best will in the world to actually implement that into a really rigid planning framework. So it could happen that, and I'm not saying that anybody in this room would ever have done such a thing, but it could happen that you engage with the community, um, take on board their suggestions, but it's really difficult to do anything with it because they don't really take into account those sort of planning challenges. So we wanted something that would overcome that language barrier. And we also wanted something flexible in its execution, so it could be used in um, a variety of remote and rural contexts because there is no one remote and rural. Um, and we also wanted something that would have a variety of different sort of uses, so different outputs. So how do you actually play the game? Um, well, there's um, a picture of some of our uh, fine remote and rural Scottish residents playing the game there. Um, basically, this game would really be played as part of a wider process of engagement. So you'd want to have already gone through a long period of trust building, relationship building, and information sharing. So service providers would share information about budgets, about which services the community has and how often they access them, that kind of thing. And communities would have shared information about um, their priorities as well. And to play the game, you gather together community members, service providers, and service managers. Um, if you've got a lot of them, um, you can easily break up into sort of manageable size groups as long as there's a manager at each table and then come back together at the end. So what you'd first do um, is agree community needs. So look at what the, um, all of this data that you've collected throughout your whole process. Agree with all of these groups, what are your maybe top five to 10 community needs? And actually that's been quite a smooth step for all of the communities we've done it with. The second step is to match those needs to skill cards. And I've just got, I don't know if anyone can see those, but I've got some with me here. Um, and these skill cards are actually based on core professional competencies for people within um, NHS Scotland, um, local <laughs> authorities, and also some voluntary groups who would be able to work within remote and rural areas. So we haven't got anyone in there that wouldn't be appropriate within that area. So we haven't got any, for example, thoracic surgeons in the mix or anything like that. 
Um, so you'd really just look at these skills and say, OK, which skills are needed to address the needs that you've said that you have? So, so far, quite simple. The next stage is to think about who would actually have those skills. So what type of worker would actually have those skills? Um, what you'd then do is use these cards, which there was also a picture of on the last slide. And these are um, anonymous practitioner cards. So on the back, they list um, the different skills that the practitioner has. Um, we've kept them anonymous because um, sort of evidence shows that um, in a planning process, people tend to ask for what they've previously had. So um, there's a tendency to fixate on posts and people rather than to think about skills. Um, but they've also got the cost of that practitioner. So what we then do is, using a community budget, create a hypothetical healthcare plan that incorporates all of these real-life planning restrictions. And that's really where it's very important to have a manager sitting at each table um, to be able to make sure that these things um, are within regulations. Um, so we've used this in a few communities. Um, and we found that um, the game can actually be used for a number of different things. It can be used for educational purposes. So you can use it to teach people about how planning actually works. Um, you can use it to agree skill requirements. So, for example, um, we had one community that took the skill cards and used them with their manager to create a job description for a generic rural worker. So that was quite useful. Or for full plan creation. Um, and as it says there, the game is actually currently being trialled in rural Australia. But we'd be really interested to find out whether this sounds like something that could work in, in other contexts. So, I'm just going to pass on to Sarah Ann right now to tell you about some of our other tools. Thanks. So um, I'd like to move on from um, talking about engaging communities to talking about engaging the rural health workforce. Um, so the first example um, I'd like to, to talk through today is um, a project where we're, we're currently developing um, a bottom-up workforce planning framework for our rural general hospitals um, in Highland. And this um, project was really um, designed in relation to um, a challenge that was identified in our area, and that was around staffing our rural general hospitals, where there tends to be um, a heavy reliance on temporary junior doctors um, and also on locum doctors. So that has implications for um, the um, continuity of staffing, but also um, the cost of staffing for these hospitals. Um, and the approach that we took uh, through this project was to uh, design workforce engagement that would involve staff in designing but then also appraising <coughs> different staffing solutions for their own hospitals. So we're aiming to include those um, who would subsequently have to implement change in the, in the design of that change. And trying to change mindsets where staff felt that their opinions or their input had previously been um, valued. So the engagement process that we um, designed, we're currently um, trialling this process within Highland. The first stage is based around workshops where we would involve um, hospital staff in multidisciplinary groups, um, but we'd also involve stakeholders, for example, members of the community or um, local GPs who can play um, a, a key role in the running of the hospital in terms of the referrals, for example. Um, and these workshops are facilitated in order to generate ideas for staffing and service delivery. But then that moves on um, to involve the staff and stakeholders in a SWOT analysis of the options that they suggest, and then actually plan out um, implementation action plans for what could be taken forward. So we're moving right from uh, the generation of ideas through to um, the analysis and action plans for implementation, so that staff are involved in looking at what might actually be feasible for their hospital. And stage two is a participatory options appraisal. And this is the stage that we're just reaching now within the project. So again, we're involving staff in workshops where they would be uh, shortlisting the options generated from stage one. Um, but within that workshop process, the staff actually are involved in agreeing the assessment criteria that would be used and then applying that to evaluate options. And that would sit alongside a financial options appraisal. So some key lessons so far from the work we've been doing here is that um, a continued engagement with the workforce has been very valued throughout the process. Um, staff and stakeholders are also, um, they also really value the fact that the um, generation and selection of options has been transparent. 
Um, and we think that this type of engagement can help us to identify locally appropriate changes. So different types of changes have been uh, suggested for the different hospitals involved in the project. So we think the outcomes will be not only a financial and non-financial options appraisal that can be useful for um, the management, but also an engagement framework for tackling these types of staffing issues through participatory options appraisal. And the second project um, I'd like to mention in relation to um, workforce engagement is around facilitating engagement with green space. So by that I mean natural spaces or outdoor environments. And again, this related to a particular challenge that had been identified in our region, where NHS Scotland currently owns a number of green spaces, for example, a forest or a lawn or grassy area um, adjacent to their clinical facilities. Um, and the question was, how can we use these green spaces to improve health? So potentially to encourage people to increase their physical activity by going outside, um, or to use outdoor spaces to reduce stress, for example. Um, and by implementing um, initiatives to encourage use of these spaces, would that actually have um, an impact, a positive impact, on health service delivery within the clinical setting? So the approach that we took here was to create and test best practice engagement for healthcare green space, but also to develop a framework to capture the impact of any initiatives. And the tool that we used within the engagement here was participatory mapping. So essentially the creation of maps by a community. That could be a community of place, such as a village. Um, in this case, it was um, the community of um, stakeholders associated with a particular hospital. And we used it to capture knowledge on the hospital grounds, so how people use the grounds, their perceptions of them, and any potential improvements that they think would help them use these spaces um, more effectively. So the theory is that by understanding this space, we could make any interventions more successful. And the types of interventions we're discussing with our um, participants are led activities such as exercise classes or taking rehabilitation programs into the outdoors, but also physical improvements to the green space could be as simple as just putting in some more benches so that people have places to rest when they're going outside. Um, so this is just an example of one of the paper maps that we've used in our workshop process, showing the hospital at the top um, and the different green spaces associated with it. Um, and you can see how people have um, drawn on the different routes that they take through the green space um, and also stuck on some suggestions there for improvements and the different feelings associated um, with the different types of space, such as the woodland or the lake. And what we can do is then digitise that map so it becomes um, a useful resource in any planning, further planning or decision making around what's going to happen in the green space and different initiatives. So we've used the participatory mapping with small staff groups, um, but it's also been part of what we called a graffiti wall for wider staff engagement. So the maps were displayed in the hospital foyer um, and any staff who couldn't come along to the workshops were able to add their contributions in that um, in that graffiti wall. And we've also used it with community focus groups to understand how community members might be able to use these spaces. It's been a very popular method with participants who found it, I think, quite um, fun to take part in our mapping exercises. We have certainly found it useful in capturing their opinions and understandings of what's essentially a spatial issue, because we're talking about um, a particular defined green space. And it's helped us to identify interventions and improvements that we could take forward. Um, one suggestion from the staff group being um, the possibility for conservation on prescription activities for cardiac rehabilitation patients. So that would be um, the opportunity for these patients to take part in conservation activities in the forest, um, with the theory being it might help combat the stress associated with their um, rehabilitation process. So um, we've kind of gone really quickly through um, four of the, the tools and processes that we've um, developed. And I just wanted to finish off by highlighting um, that we think engaging participants in the evaluation of interventions is also um, equally important. Um, and for us, this has often been about going beyond the traditional feedback questionnaire. So thinking about involving participants in evaluation in more active ways. For example, in the Green Space Project, we will be collecting self-reported health data, but we'll be combining that with ethnographic approaches, where um, the research researchers, for example, will go along to the activities um, and look at the lived experience for participants in uh, detail. 
In the CCAP project, we've also used community focus groups to evaluate the questionnaire. And we've been piloting walking interview technology. Um, that's where um, it's a mobile data collection method where a researcher and um, a participant will walk around a space such as the hospital grounds and just talk about the impact um, on the participant. Um, and we can capture the root of the interview and the interview itself. So we can really start to understand um, the re relationship between a space um, and the impact of, of the intervention itself. Um, and we're also starting to work with social return on investment techniques um, which can help us to value um, a range of impacts from social to environmental um, and economic and take into consideration um, the evaluation of a range of stakeholders. Um, and the thing about social return on investment is it really involves stakeholders in the identification of which indicators we'll use in the evaluation um, and what kinds of changes are taking place as the result of an, uh, an intervention. So quickly just wanted to show you some of the outputs from a walking interview, for example, where we've used GPS technology to track um, the route where one um, participant has shown me around um, a hospital ground space and that we can link that with interview text and also with um, user-generated photographs as well. Um, and just quickly an example from our social return on investment work, which is again, it's, it's ongoing at the moment. Um, but we, we're starting to see that this is um, useful as a really holistic evaluation process. Um, this diagram here just relates to our, um, our suggested cardiac rehabilitation intervention. Um, and it illustrates just some of the stakeholders involved there and how we started to identify the change processes for each of the stakeholders. Um, and it's been useful, for example, in thinking not just about the participants, but also about the NHS um, or the state and where potential cost and efficiency savings could come from there. So I think um, Amy's just going to finish up by um, trying to pull out some of the key engagement lessons. Yes. Thank you. Um, so you've heard about a few different um, engagement processes that we've, we've used so far. Um, some, a tool for um, involving the community in sort of what it is that they value about a service and finding out things from them that way. Um, a tool that looks at involving the community in partnership primary care planning. Uh, a tool that involves staff in bottom-up um, workforce planning. And a tool that involves, um, here we've described it as, as a staff tool, but we've also obviously used it with community and patient groups too, um, for designing activities um, that can be used as, as uh, health interventions in green spaces. Um, so obviously we've done these projects, and um, any of you that have actually done engagement will already, um, these lessons won't really come as any kind of surprise to you, but I think they're worth reiterating. Um, the first one was that we, um, we found through our experience that continued engagement is really key, and by that we mean um, there's a tendency within, um, I think, a lot of healthcare boards to view engagement as sort of a, a project management type of thing. So you plan it, um, you do the action, and you evaluate it, and it's done. And actually, we found that to be a really harmful approach quite often. So um, involving people all the way through to implementation um, was really the only way that we found to maintain that sort of stakeholder relationship, but also the importance there of being really dedicated to following through with anything that comes out of this engagement. So a lot of people who didn't view the engagement as continuous would just come up to a roadblock and then say, oh, sorry, it's not going to work. And that was it. Um, it was important to make decisions in a transparent manner, so to make sure that everybody understands where their contribution has actually gone, um, but also to include all of those who are affected by and or will implement the change, so to try and not leave anyone out. Um, we found that sharing information was really key, especially around things like financial information. And that was so uncomfortable for a lot of health boards to try and give up that information that previously had been kept to themselves. Um, they felt very vulnerable telling communities about it. But actually, we found that the only way that communities could actually co-plan a service with a manager was if they had access to the same information that a manager has for decision making. So it sounds simple, but it's not something that's really being done a lot. Um, we found that um, actually using an iterative engagement methodology is really a great way to go. Um, so you can continually evaluate what you're doing. So maybe after each time that you meet with the community, 
um, evaluate what you're doing so that it's becoming more and more contextually appropriate. That's what we did with the Remote Service Futures game. So every time we played it, um, we refined it a little bit more so that it was more and more usable for remote and rural communities. Um, and the final thing is to be really honest, not just with communities, but also yourselves, about the influence that people are actually going to have over decision making. So not to go into a community when you pretty much have your mind made up about what's going to happen um, and let them think that they have sort of a blank slate. So that's fairly common sense, but it does happen. Um, so what we'd really hoped was that today we would have one of those handy rooms like next door with the tables and we could get you all to play these games and we really wanted to do that but I just don't think the room is going to work for that. Um, so what we'd like to do instead um, is to get you to maybe um, try and uh, connect with your neighbours if you don't know them all the better um, and we'd like to get you to spend a few minutes talking about whether you think um, the methods that we've described have any application in your particular country or context. I mean, for some of them, we've obviously just um, refined them somewhat to work within our context, and you may have used iterations of those methods before, um, and we'd like to hear about that too. Um, but yeah, if we, could, um, if we could maybe do that for a couple of minutes um, and then come back together, just get everyone to stretch their legs and wake up after lunch. So um, go forth. <laughs>
much, everybody. Um, if I could get some people to start feeding back to us about, um, about what they think about their own local context and whether any of this would work, we'll maybe use that as a starting point for discussion and we'll take any questions as well. So anybody want to start us off? If not, I will pick people. I'm not, I'm not scared of doing that. Oh, yes. You at the back. No. Anybody? Okay, uh, let's go over here, one of you guys. <laughs> Thank you. We come from Sweden, mm -hmm. and uh, we were talking, about, we, we have done some of this, mm -hmm. uh, partially. We have in one community that I work in, um, um, corporations between uh, the churches, the primary care, mm -hmm. uh, the social services, libraries, mm -hmm. uh, all, e everything okay. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> and uh, the main idea is to either, either um, uh, talk about s things like have, having you know, talks about things like sleeplessness, which is very stress, you know, which mm -hmm. is very common. and. Um, and uh, otherwise to arrange activities for those that don't meet people. Okay. For, uh, that have difficulties, you know, just everybody's not very... So those are the kind of ideas that come out of engaging with that, yeah, with that group? Yeah, because the other ones they can manage on their own. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Anybody else? Oh, I'm going to pick on someone. Um, gentleman in the blue shirt in the aisle. Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay, well, I am from Canada and I work uh, primarily in the north part of the country, in the Northwest Territories. Mm -hmm. So uh, we work with uh, very isolated communities often, uh, First Nations and Inuit communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so some of our challenges are working across culture uh, because the, as um, you know, non-Aboriginal people, we were often viewed with some suspicion about what we're planning to do or not mm -hmm. to do. And, and so we need to often, um, like I, we were just discussing, my partner here was from New Zealand, so we, we had some similarities, believe it or not. But uh, we, we have to uh, often work with uh, elders the, w w which have a high level of respect in the community and so we get the permission from the leadership and we work with the elders to design our community consultation process mm -hmm. and uh, so some of the tools that you're using uh, you know we would need to adapt but we yes. we've done some of this work our, our, our already great thank you very much yeah that's interesting because I mean I wouldn't say that we Myself, I'm Canadian as well, and going into sort of remote and rural Scotland, I wouldn't say that I was accepted as, as a native myself. So, um, yeah, I think there's always a need to find those key sort of gatekeepers for the community. Thank you. Anybody want to volunteer? Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm from Ghana. I work in the rural part of Ghana, and most of what you have presented, we might have done most of them, but what we don't use is the skill card, okay. but we, we sort of look at it by thinking, okay. so we yeah. meet them, and what we also do is we engage the most influential people in the community. Then we have people called volunteers who are within the community, who can organize the community members for us. The challenge we have is to get uh, two communities together okay. so, because it's sort of a challenge mm -hmm. which, and, and finance constraint is difficult to go from community to community. Okay. This is some of the challenge, these are some of the challenges we have. And then getting the, uh, when there's a, a, a meeting, most of the men will not be part. They prefer the, the women to be part. Okay. So you go to a meeting and get most of them are being women. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, we have um, we have some similar challenges in Scotland with um, when you um, when you have a, a public meeting or an, an open event like that, you can tend to get the same people coming along, and they tend to be um, economically advantaged. They tend to be people who are well educated and able to eloquently express themselves, um, and they tend to have the sort of loudest voice as well. So, um, what we always have tried to advocate is. Um, making sure that you have um, a multiplicity of tools in your arsenal when you go out to engage with people. So, for example, when we do the Remote Service Futures game, we also always advertise in local shops and everything um, that we will also do home interviews. So, in each of those rural communities we've gone in um, and quite often have been able to speak to quite a few people who wouldn't be comfortable speaking at a larger community meeting. So, that's something else that I don't know if that's helpful, but thank you. Um, does anybody actually have any questions about the presentation or anything that they... Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you hi. for this wonderful uh, presentation. I have a question, please. Uh, how do you usually select the stakeholders? What are the criteria for selection? Or you just go ahead and meet people and discuss issues? It depends. It depends on the project, really. Um, for um, something like the Remote Service Futures game, where we're going into um, a remote and rural community, um, we tend to use um, what we'd call a snowball method. So we'd start off by um, identifying um, the most visible people in the community, so the health professionals, community councils, organizations that are already there. But then we go into the community itself, make sure that we stay there for a few days, um, and sort of speaking to people leads to speaking to more people to speaking to more people um, and but we also make sure that we advertise um, for something like the green space project um, we did actually do a, a, an analysis um, to consider who the stakeholders would be um, and for the for the CCAT project I think it's just everybody that's over 16 in the community gets one of those it, I don't know if you yeah it's through the GP practice list so mm -hmm. everyone would be given the opportunity to be involved. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I'm from South Africa, Hi. and I just want to find out as to whether the community members that you work with um, do not ask for any financial incentives, um, because that's the problem that we have in South Africa. That when you need people to take part in, you know, um, development, uh, they will always ask for incentives and, and even when you have got people that are interested, you work with them maybe for two or three months and mm -hmm. if they realize that there's no financial incentive, then they will go and look for jobs. So you keep on losing interested people because they've got to go and look for jobs um, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, in most cases when they see people coming in into the rural areas, they believe that now here is some employment for us. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to check as to whether you do not face such uh, situations. Do you want to? Yeah, I think um, no, we've not we've not had to face that situation. I guess um, <coughs> well, with the, with our rural populations, they are increasingly aging populations. So we're dealing with a lot of people who are maybe only employed part time, um, or or who are retired or retired early. Um, but I think I guess we've been quite flexible in our the way that we go about the engagement, so that we can hold events in the evenings or the weekends as well, so that it wouldn't affect the times when people were. Um, necessarily going to be at work but mm -hmm. um, yeah I think it's about for us it's been about stressing the benefit to the community and trying to harness people's um, enthusiasm for um, their kind of willingness to help others and, and help sustain their community and I guess that's been the incentive for yeah. them and I mean to be honest with with healthcare issues in remote and rural Scotland it's quite often a sensitive topic there's quite often been some kind of conflict in the community with the health service before certainly in most of the communities that we've been in so there's a lot of interest already in attending these things mainly on a sort of um, a protective basis so that they can go out there and make sure that people know that they want what they have or they want something else. Um, so 
there's been a lot of interest. We haven't really had a big problem with that. But we certainly make sure, in terms of other types of access, we try and make sure that all the printed materials we have are available in a, a variety of formats, um, that we go to people's homes who aren't able to access things. And um, yeah, we haven't, we haven't offered financial in incentive, but we have offered um, quite often food, um, tea, tea cheese and wine mm -hmm. at one point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I might take uh, another couple of questions and before we wrap up. I'm not sure it's the same thing, but we have, what we've done is we've used people and organizations who already do something similar, mm -hmm. uh, like people working in churches, but everyone working with the same goal and, uh, and trying to reach those who, who don't come normally, like breakfast for grumpy old men. Yeah. <laughs> Thank and you. that's very popular. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, food works. Food works. So does wine, but it was somewhat frowned upon by the NHS representative present, <laughs> I should say. Well, thank you. I might uh, ask one last question. Um, what advice would you have for people in, when we think about time for, of actually doing community consultations and community engagement? Um, because I, I guess it doesn't happen overnight and you're talking about advertising and, and mm -hmm. raising awareness. So what advice would you have in terms of planning? What, what's realistic? Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think what needs to happen, I don't know, Sarah I might have a different perspective on this, but I think what needs to happen in Scotland specifically is that there needs to be a culture shift within the NHS because at present this is seen as an add-on, but it's also a requirement. So. Um, people see this as something sort of annoying that they also have to do as part of their job, but it is something that they have to do. And I think that sort of management needs to build time in to people's jobs to be able to do that. Um, in terms of remote and rural communities and time, one thing that I would say is a lot of people don't engage with these communities in a really meaningful way and they don't go out and spend time in these communities because it's seen as such a big time commitment. But actually if you go out to a community and you spend two days of your time there, um, the amount of work that you can get done while you're there, you can do interviews, you can do meetings, you can speak with the local GPs, you can do a lot of stuff in one go. Um, that you would normally have to do in sort of bits throughout the year. So actually it is a reasonably efficient way of doing things. Um, and we found that it can be quite cost effective as well. So I, I think if there's a will, you'll find the time to do it. Yeah. That might be naive. But. Yeah, I think building on, <laughs> building on what's already available to help you as well. So you yes. know, we've we've kind of discussed just here that you know that there is a wealth of experience out there. So trying to trying to look at what's what's already there and mm -hmm. I guess not not start again yeah. every, every and occasion, speaking so. to your peers I mean within mm. this room alone yeah. there's loads of experience on this topic probably more than we have together so mm. you know speaking to each other about yeah. how people fit it in with their jobs but I do mm. think it's if it's if it is a requirement and if it is something you have to do it should be done well or else it's more damaging than if you don't do anything at all mm. And I think, um, I mean, a couple of people just approached me to ask where our, our resources are available, and they're available on the Centre for Rural Health website, so you can go there and, and have a look and start, start using these things um, mm -hmm. straight away. And um, I don't know if we've put, put yeah. the website there, but we've put, we've put our email address, so you can, you know, we're very welcome to get in touch with us. And we do have some materials that you can um, take, and that they'll have links to the different toolkits there as well. Mm -hmm. So if you want anything, just yeah. just approach us at the end of the session. Yeah. Yeah. Remote Service Futures game is available free online, as is the CCAT, and um, we also have um, some engagement toolkits that you can take away. But we also offer some some training, which is online, so might be available internationally. Mm -hmm. So um, just Google Center for Rural Health, yeah. and you'll get everything you need. So thank you very thank much. You very much. Thank, thank you, Amy and Sarah. That was a wonderful presentation and very innovative. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and now we'll just um, have our second presentation. I'll just grab my piece of paper. Just Hello. introduce. Hello. Hello. Yes, I know he <laughs> but it's got the beep. <laughs> um, so this is Professor Ross Bailey, um, who's an ARC Future Fellow and is also from Menzies School of Health Research in Australia. And Ross will be presenting um, Australian Indigenous Primary Health Care Comparisons. So, I'll just give you some time to set up.
Sorry. Um, thanks a lot, Drew. So, um, I like the title, ARC Future Fellow. As you get into your 50s, it's really nice that somebody thinks you've got something in the future. Um, I, um, I work for an organisation called Menzies School of Health Research. Um, I grew up in South Africa and trained in, um, in medicine and public health and have worked as a GP in, in New Zealand. But for the last um, 15, 17 years, I've been working in Aboriginal primary health care services research and public health research. Um, the organisers of the conference have put me in a slightly awkward situation because the title of this, of, of what they've put into the program is, bears very little resemblance to the title of the abstract that I, that I put in. I was, I really put in an abstract that was, uh, was about describing a, a program of research which has been um, uh, supporting and developing and facilitating a, the implementation of a quality improvement uh, uh, process in primary health care services, Aboriginal primary health care services in Australia. Um, it's got, uh, I can see the relevance to what they said, Indigenous primary health care comparisons, but that's not really what I was going to talk about. Um, it does uh, it does have bearing on engaging with your community, but that's also not sort of was, was not the central theme of my um, of my presentation. So, in the spirit of that question, what matters to you? Can I just get a feeling of why people are here? Are you here because you're especially interested in in the topic of engaging with your community? Hands up. Yeah. Are you are you here because you're interested in Indigenous health and primary health care services in Australia and hearing some more about that. Okay, so, and are you here because you're interested in both things? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, I'll, I'll do my best and, and, and we'll see how we go. Um, this light is really uh, distracting. Sorry if I look like I'm squinting at you. Um, so what, what, I'll, what I'll do is just run, run through the, the, the outline of the presentation. So I'm go I'll give you a bit of a background to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health um, and raise the question of how do we define communities. Um, I'll talk a bit about working at multiple levels of the health system because this is a critical issue in terms of achieving large scale change and scaling up uh, uh, quality improvement programs and raise the question then with you about what does this mean for in terms of community engagement. Um, I'll then talk a bit about the National Research Partnership Indigenous Primary Health Care um, and I want you to help me with some advice on how would we know, how would we assess whether this partnership is working, whether it, you know, how well we're doing, how might we do better and I'm interested in hearing examples from others' experience where there's some similarities so um, we'll just see how we go time-wise with, with that. This is a map of um, Aboriginal languages in Australia at the time of uh, colonisation, just a bit more than 200 years ago. And it just gives you some idea of the diversity of Aboriginal peoples living in Australia at, at that time. There were about 270 different language groups. The population then was estimated to be between 500,000 and a million people. Um, it's one of the oldest surviving cultures in the world, in the, in the world 40 to 50,000 years. Um, and they had various well-established ways of managing land and society in, in, a, in a sustainable way. Um, we don't know an awful lot about the health status of, of Aboriginal people at the time of colonisation, but there's certainly reports of some very healthy and vigorous and, and thriving society in many parts of Australia. Um, the colonisation had a devastating effect on the health of Aboriginal people. Um, we think that in the 1920s, from that estimated 500,000 to a million people, the population was down to about 60,000. Um, and the history of government policies has, uh, has successive policies of protectionism and assimilation, assimilation and programs of, uh, that have become known as stolen wages and stolen, genera uh, stolen generations. This was the removal of um, 
children from their families and so on has led to uh, a very severe impact on the things that we now recognise as a very critical um, uh, social determinants of health and, um, and on social and emotional well-being and uh, that has consequences for intergenerational trauma but also gaps in education, employment, wealth and health and these are obviously important ongoing factors in influencing the health of uh, Indigenous people in Australia today. This is a picture from um, not, not that many decades ago, um, a remote community, Northern Australia, an island community. Um, you can see the influence of the, of the church. Um, similar about 40, 40, 50 years ago, um, some of the sort of housing that was in, in remote communities at that time, also in Northern Australia. And at that time, a lot of the medical services were fly and fly out sort of services in this, in this sort of uh, aircraft. Um, about this photograph is from less than 10 years ago so it gives you some idea of the quality of housing and the challenges of maintaining housing in sort of remote community environments this community is about three hours drive out of from darwin and uh, severe problems of, of crowding and uh, uh, not just the basic house infrastructure but availability of furniture and and um, amenities within the household and this is a, a, a photograph from one of the main um, national newspapers just, illust just illustrating that this has, uh, has something that has att attracted national media attention. This is a photograph of a family. Apparently all of these people lived in this one three-bedroom house uh, behind them. Um, just going back to the point about diversity of population, the, the map on the left um, just shows uh, the distribution of Aboriginal people in Australia. And you can see that there's quite a strong concentration in, in, in the southeast. In fact, 80% of the Australian total Australian population live in that southeast corner. Um, and Aboriginal people also predominantly live in urban centres and major major regional centres um, but they tend to be overrepresented in, in, in rural and remote areas. Um, the current population, estimated population is a bit over 500,000 people. So the, the project that I'm going to be talking about actually covers primary health care services which are spread across uh, four states and the Northern Territory. And just some quick idea of geography. The distance from Adelaide here in the south to Darwin up in the north is about 3,000 kilometres. Um, the Northern Territory which is the box in the middle at the top there is about 1,000 kilometres east to west and 1,500 kilometres north to south and there are about 200,000 people total living in, in the Northern Territory and about half of those live in, in the Greater Darwin region. Um, so you can see it's a very dispersed uh, population, major challenges to service provision, not just health service provision but all sorts of service provision. In many parts uh, of the country, remote areas are isolated by floodwaters or, or, or fly in, fly out only sort of access. Um, you can see there has been major investment in, in the sort of how in, in, in housing. So, for example, at a house in the background, um, but the maintenance um, and support for people to live in, in this sort of housing continues to be a major challenge. Uh, just to illustrate health disparities, um, this on the right hand side you can see is the uh, all cause mortality rate for Aboriginal people in Australia. Um, the 10th decile for Australia is here. So overall, that's the 
10% of general Australian population with the, uh, with, with the worst mortality is about half of what we see as the mortality for Aboriginal Australians. And you can see over here, um, if we just go to the, the fifth decile, that's about, uh, you can see the mortality for Aboriginal Australians is about four times higher than, than the, the average or the fifth decile for, for uh, the, t the general population. Just gives you some idea of the disparities. And we see that sort of disparity at multiple levels of the health system. So, um, for example, prevalence of diabetes is two to four times higher, hospitalisation rates 10 to 15 times higher, and mortality rates for 35 to 54 year old group is around 30 times higher. So apologies for the poor quality of the photograph, but the idea is just to give you a, um, a picture of an example of a community. So this is a desert community, Central Australia. Um, but going back to the point, this, this is just one example of a very diverse range of different types of communities. And while the fly-in, fly-out sort of services, the aeroplanes might be more modern, we're still you know, quite reliant on fly-in, fly-out type, type services in many health centres. So... Um, the history of colonisation and the challenges um, are very significant. Uh, just a couple of cartoons, these are more than 10 years old now, but to illustrate you know, an ongoing debate about um, who has a say in, in service provision and service delivery design and the history of decisions largely being made by bureaucrats um, uh, with very little community engagement. And uh, and this feeling and tension that you know bureaucrats are there, they're collecting lots of data, but we actually at the community level see very little change on the ground. And it's this sort of tension that has affected health research as well. So in the last ten to fifteen years, there's been a very strong drive to get much stronger community, Aboriginal community control of the research agenda. Um, and the, the organisation that I've done a lot of work with is a cooperative research centre for Aboriginal health, which, which was really set up to try and get better engagement between Aboriginal community organisations, Aboriginal controlled health services, government health departments, um, in order for research to address the priority issues for communities but also in order for the findings of research to be translated back into, into the field in a way that makes a difference and addresses community priorities, but within, within you know, um, a relevant time frames. So rather than you know, collecting data, taking it away, and years later coming back with, with the report. Um, so we've done uh, a lot of... Um, action-oriented research and the, the, the lead is the, the Cooperative Research Centre for Aboriginal Health is, is uh, led by an Aboriginal majority board and, and with an Aboriginal chairperson. So um, one of, one of the, the major projects that I've been working on now for, for more than 10 years is really introducing a primary health care quality improvement program. Um, and so this is just the first opportunity for you is uh, talking about how would we go about defining community in this sort of context, given the, the theme of this session, uh, engaging with your community. How would you define community for the purposes of implementing a, a quality improvement program in primary health care services in Aboriginal Australia? And how do you go... How would, how do you go about doing this in your own work environment? Are there similar, similar challenges? So if you can just take a couple of minutes to talk to somebody, preferably who's not working in the same organisation as you, just um, talking about how, what, what is the community that work, you work with, how do you define that community, and what are the challenges in, in defining the community? So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to do that.
Okay, can um, is somebody willing to just volunteer a couple of challenges that, that you face in, in your community, um, in, in defining the community where you, where you work in your own context? Anybody willing to just identify one particular challenge in defining your community? No? No volunteers? You've kind of shamed us because <laughs> the communities that we thought we had problems with <laughs> and were difficult, we suddenly feel like we're living in utopia and mm. we haven't really got a problem at all. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean Having to shame, seen, <laughs> didn't mean to shame your anybody. Yeah. So yeah. far. So yeah. things that we find difficult are nothing. On, in scale comparison to you. Um, I work in Wales and we have got some deprived areas but nothing like that level of deprivation. Um, this lady is from Finland and we were just saying uh, there are some areas that haven't got access to, to medical services. The transport is very mm. good so it sort of negates that again. Yeah. Um, I'm involved at the moment um, in improvement work in stroke services in Wales and we're now looking at the services provided in the community so we've just done an engagement exercise where we invited the only stakeholders we were invited were stroke survivors and their carers and we didn't allow any professionals in on the day and we sat down and had facilitators and what we've done is we've taken the work from that and by them telling us what they want and we also ask them if we get it right how best do we measure it and they've given us advice on how we should measure and know if we're being successful so we're now taking that forward mm. to engage with our social care voluntary sector and our health providers to try and come up with services that are actually meeting the needs mm. of the people. Um, and we'll use their measurement tools to evaluate whether we're succeeding or not. Great, thanks. So any other um, challenges with defining communities in, in, in the context that others are working in? Anybody else want to identify a particular challenge that you face in defining community? Well, this, this issue of how do you engage community, you have to start with understanding who, who is your community, who is the community you're trying to engage with. community where it might be specific to the geographical area but then within that geographical area in an urban area for example it might be different picture to a rural area mm. where there might be similarities with the people who live in the rural area and so the diversity might not be significant but in an urban area as well as the geographical area there are people from different backgrounds maybe mm. um, people with different comorbidities. Mm. Um, so it really depends on the context of what you're addressing. Okay, great. Okay, I think that, I mean, that, that this challenge of defining communities is, is really difficult. It is, uh, they are, uh, you may define community in many different ways, but whether you do it on a geographic basis, population group basis, uh, a community of interests, or as a group of professionals there, there are always tensions within that. that they tend to be dynamic. There, there are communities change over time. There are a lot of vested interests. So it, those are all major challenges. Uh, they may be loosely organised, dispersed, or they might be quite concentrated. They're all major challenges in how do we approach this issue of, of, of community engagement. So um, the way that we've... we've uh, approached this question of how do we develop and implement a, a process of uh, quality improvement in, in Aboriginal primary care centres is we've used a, tip, a fairly typical 
sort of CQR cycle, but we have a very strong emphasis on those first steps, so understanding respective roles and responsibilities um, and, and who's responsible for what in the CQR process. And a strong emphasis not only on getting health service teams to understand what the CQR process is about, but also the, health, the, the CQR team in understanding what is this environment, what is this context that, that we are trying to work in and with who are the, who are the people and organisations. We use a, a, a typical clinical audit sort of process, but also a systems assessment tool, which is really based on the chronic care model but we have uh, expanded it to, to really strengthen the community linkages and, and, um, and the broader sort of policy and community environment aspect so that it's more consistent with the WHO framework for inno of innovative care for chronic conditions. We have a very strong emphasis on participation in each step of the cycle both in terms of gathering the data but also interpreting and understanding what it means. We used a web-based information system to, to analyse the data so that there's a report back to the health centre team in real time. So as soon as they've entered the data, there's a quality Im improvement report on the desk in the health centre. The action planning process is very much about facilitating the health team in an action planning process with the understanding that it's their responsibility to implement the actions and that this is an ongoing cycle. Some really important um, principles and documents that, ha that have guided this work. On the left hand side, there, there, there's been a, over the last 10, 15 years, um, the development and documentation of indigenous health research values and ethics. So this is a process that's been led by Aboriginal people where they've done a lot of community consultation to define what are the values and ethics in, that, that they expect to be applied in, re, in health research. And that's now a, a national standard that you, as a researcher, you're expected to address the criteria that are set out in that, in that document. Um, the principles of many of the principles of quality improvement are critical to this process of engagement, and I won't dwell on those. The, but the other literature that we found very useful is the literature on community-based participatory action research, and so the article by Barbara Israel from 1998, and just the principles underpinning community-based participatory action research have been have been re very important. In terms of the scale-up sort of approach. Uh, the theory around diffusion of innovation and lit literature around diffusion of innovation has been important and also the, the and this is reflected in the Aboriginal health values and ethics document is this broad view of primary health care so we're not talking about primary care or primary medical care we're talking about comprehensive primary health care which is addressed about addressing community priorities. So in terms of scaling up, we need to, and, and also in terms of achieving any sort of change at a, at a regional level, we feel like we need to work at multiple levels of the system to see, achieve significant change. Certainly you can achieve change at the local health centre level, but if you're going to achieve sustainable change and broader change um, in the system, you really need to work at multiple levels of the, of the system. And that brings a new challenge to what do we mean by community engagement because there's a whole new uh, group of communities or interest groups who we need to achieve engagement with if we're talking about working at multiple levels of the health system and not only the, the primary health care team. So is that a common challenge for people here? Is that uh, familiar with you in terms of community engagement and do you see management and, and health system structures as a community that you need to engage with in order to make change? People working in quality improvement work, people trying to make a difference? Yeah. Well, they control the leaders. So yeah. You, uh, you have no option. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to get started. Can people hear the comments yeah. from the front? Do you want to? Do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> So Dale's just making the point that they, they uh, 
people in the system, bureaucrats, typically control the levers, so you, we have to work with, with them. Um, the question is how do we engage with them as part of the sort of community engagement process. Any other comments? We'll keep going. So we started um, this this program of work about ten years ago. In uh, and the initial phase was we designed a sort of CQR process and some tools um, and tested the feasibility and acceptability and the impact in twelve health centres in in the top end uh, of the Northern Territory. Um, and the focus then was on <coughs> diabetes care and preventive care. Um, this sort of multiple, we, when, when we set up the project and through the process of engagement and, and designed it, and this was one of the strengths that came through that cooperative research centre for Aboriginal health, that cooperative research centre actually provided the framework of engagement with, with the health industry at multiple levels. So we actually already had that established framework and network to work within and actually that really facilitated the sort of engagement and involvement of, of partners at multiple levels of, of the system. Um, we, we really are focused very strongly, while we have an interest in working at those levels, we really focused on providing support to local health teams to improve quality of care at the local health centre level. That remains our primary focus but we understand that we need to work at other levels of the system really to achieve sustainable change. So um, on the basis of some you know, uh, evidence of feasibility and acceptability and, and positive engagement by those 12 health centres in, in the top end, um, we then developed an extension phase of the project from 2006 to 2009. Um, this has all been funded by research. Um, but what the research funding allowed us to do was really to provide some infrastructure for, for us and the, some resources to develop the tools and, and the information system um, and to support hub coordinators to work in five different regions around the country to work directly with primary health care teams. And we also tried to get support around those hub coordinators by um, leading researchers based in each region but also lead service providers in, in each region um, and that was really trying to get that sort of engagement at different levels and uh, different stakeholders in the system. So in addition to the 69 services that were formally enrolled in the research we were also able to give access to the tools and processes to another 70 services which expressed interest in, being, in using the tools but didn't want to formally enrol in, in, in the research process. Um, so the one aspect of extension was this geographic extension to five different regions across the country. The other aspect of the extension was that we went beyond the initial focus on diabetes care and preventive care to include other major chronic diseases. So we now have a tool called a vascular and metabolic tool which includes cardiovascular and renal as well as diabetes care. Um, we've developed tools for child health, maternal health, mental health, rheumatic heart disease as well. And we are now extending this sort of quality improvement approach to non-clinical areas. So we've developed a health promotion audit tool um, and are working on uh, community food supply, quality improvement tools and environmental health and housing tools which present a whole lot of new challenges in how do you develop a quality improvement approach. And it's a whole new group of stakeholders that you need to be engaged in quality improvement processes trying to address these uh, other very important parts of the health system. Because of the, bio, so that research project was funded through 2009 and as we came towards the end of that we had over 140 services that were engaged in in that project in some way um, and we needed to find a way to continue to support those services. We set up this not-for-profit um, organisation which is a fee-for-service organisation really uh, intended with the intention that it would be funded by 
by state governments, territory governments and, and large health authorities to fund us to support, to work with services who chose to participate or, or use the tools. And um, we now have, we're about, about two years into that, that project, this, the organisation is called 12170. We've got 100, uh, uh, about 180 services who are covered by contracts in five states and, and the Northern Territory. We've trained about 500 practitioners um, and we, the health authorities in both Queensland, which Rue works with, where are you Rue? Rue works with Queensland Health and has got a major role in supporting this, the, these uh, CQI process. They've funded, who are now established part of the health system in both Queensland and the Northern Territory, they've got CQI coordinator and facilitator positions um, uh, spread across the, the, the Queensland and the Northern Territory. So just trying to pull this together and how do we make, how do we make this work or understand this from a, uh, from the perspective of, uh, of a research initiative which is really aiming to achieve large scale change and population health impact. There are sort of three, four, sorry, four, um, I'm an epidemiologist. <laughs> um, there, there are four main areas of sort of, uh, of work that have been critical. One is the quality, modern quality improvement methods and the principles that support that. And I always find these conferences inspiring because of the, just hearing about those, those principles of modern quality improvement as opposed to accreditation and quality insurance and the, the talk over the last couple of days about the importance of engaging with community and going beyond the health sector have, uh, has been really helpful I think. We, the other area of work is this um, participatory research. So I talked about community based participatory action research We've moved to thinking, trying to think about a system-based participatory action research. So that's not neglecting the community-based research, but understanding that we need to get participation at multiple levels of the system. The, one of the big challenges in quality improvement in primary care is that primary care in general practice is very dispersed and very loosely organised. Certainly in Australia it is. Um, and I think that's the case in most places, which presents real challenges for not just for research, but even sort of management and getting primary health care. Organisations ought to be sort of roughly going in the same direction. Um, but there's been some very useful work around practice-based research networks. So we're drawing on some of the lessons from practice-based research networks and research partnerships to really learn how can we work effectively across a large number of dispersed primary health care, care organisations. And of course it's really driven by the sort of principles of community based primary health care with a strong focus on population health, community diagnosis, community priorities, engagement with, with community. So question for you guys and um, we're just about out of time and so perhaps I won't I don't want to keep you away from your afternoon tea, but um, so we won't take any time, but if, I'm very interested in if people have got ideas or experience or want to talk to me about how do we understand if this partnership and engagement at multiple levels and across, uh, across multiple communities, how do we know if it's working? What, what would we want to measure um, and what would we, how would we understand whether this is really working or not and, and, and how we can make it work better? So I'd be very keen to talk to people if you've got ideas around that. These are some of the, the just drawing on the literature, the, um, some of the key things that if you look at the literature on partnerships, how do you work, get partnerships to work effectively, which in some ways is what community engagement is about. But if we're talking about engagement with the whole range of different types of communities and multiple levels of the system, this concept of partnerships is really important and so I've just pulled together some of the key points from the literature on what what are the success characteristics of effective partnerships 
Um, and I think you will see, in, in that list, you will see many of the things that we know are important to effective quality improvement efforts, which are very important to capacity building. Um, are, are reflected in the literature on, on, on community engagement. And they're very consistent with the literature on community-based participatory action research as well. So we see the same sorts of themes coming through again and again um, that really should be guiding us in how we go about this sort of work. Thank you. Are there, are there any... Any um, burning questions for Ross? Right here. I'll probably have a quick question, Ross. Um, given the slides that you presented um, at the beginning around um, the effects um, of colonisation in, in Australia, what do you think are some of the key messages around um, how do we, how should we engage communities that have lost trust? with researchers because I think that's one of the challenges I have is you do arrive as a researcher and you're just one of those researchers again who's mm. going to take and take and you sort of try and say, no, I'm different. <laughs> but, yeah. but I mean, are there other things that we need to think about? Well, I think it's a, I mean, what we've heard quite a lot over the last couple of days is this issue of building relationships and I mean, clearly it's very difficult to build relationships with people who don't want to have a relationship with you and so sometimes it's just I think a matter of just saying you know well um, really focus on on the the services or the groups that really want to work with you and that that are interested and uh, and if you can work well with those groups and build examples and demonstrate that you can work in a uh, in a responsible and community oriented way with those groups, our experience with this work so far is that is that others then will see that the building of that trust and they will learn from that and they're more likely to come on board and um, and and start to enter into those relationships but and then I guess the second point is really um, is really keeping focused on, on on their priorities on the community priorities and demonstrating that in the way that you go about the work um, and as a way of continuing to, to build trust and engagement. So I think for us it's really demonstrating a commitment to supporting to supporting services um, and, and communities to build on their assets and to and to make the best use of their available resources but to use tools and approaches and, and the sort of technical expertise that, that we can bring and the facilitation capacity that we can bring in, but using that in a way that actually enables them to address their priorities and works in a way that's consistent with the way that they would like to work. Yeah, Thank you. yeah just on that, I think it's a, a matter of <coughs> investing in leadership for the group that you're uh, involved in. So investing in leadership, having the results owned by the group that you're studying rather than owned by the university or whatever that's yeah. researching them. Yeah. And the last thing is, um, because time is never on your side, uh, early results uh, that they own. Yeah. yeah, early results, but time is never on your side, but we know that this work takes time yes. and you can't afford to rush it. Yep. And I, I, I mean, that goes back to that issue of working with, uh, with government organisations and health authorities is actually really just really working hard to get them to accept that this work does take time, but at the same time being able to demonstrate that there is progress yep. over time. So thanks for that, Dan. Anything else before we have afternoon tea? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for coming and enjoy your afternoon tea. <laughs>